All right, effective learning strategies for students. So a lot of this the information that I'm going to present to you here is based on material from a book called Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning by Peter C. Brown. So in this book, um, they, they talk about a bunch of different studies um, that have been done with really a lot of different learners from um, primary school through college. Um, there are um, some studies that have done with sports and other physical activities, learning different physical activities. So this is a wide variety of um, educational research that's sort of boiled down into this book. Um, it's really a great book to read. You probably won't have time to read it um, right now during this quarter, but I've boiled it all down for you so you don't have to. But um, the book is great because it, it uh, gives suggestions for students, it gives suggestions for teachers, it gives suggestions for coaches and uh, people like corporate trainers and that sort of thing. So these are um, learning strategies for everybody, but I'm um, picking out the learning strategies for students because I want to make it for you guys. So um, as I said in the um, classroom introduction, we're, we're kind of moving into a new area. Um, previously in academic classes, you had to learn some things for that course, for that exam, and then it's not necessarily going to apply in your next course. That is different from a professional technical program where everything we learn in this course is then going to apply in our next course, and the next course, and the next course, and the next course. And hopefully it will all um, coalesce together into a cohesive body of knowledge that then you can use for your, uh, to guide your clinical practice. So um, the learning tips that I'm going to talk about, I have them listed here and then I'm going to have a little section for each one. So um, you want to practice retrieving new learning from memory and we're, we're calling that retrieval practice. Um, you want to space out your retrieval practice. You want to interleave the study of different information types and I'll talk about what that means with each of these. Um, elaboration is relating the material to what you already know. Um, generation is attempting to answer a question or solve a problem before being shown the answer or the solution. So that's what I was saying in the classroom introduction about um, trying to take the quiz before you've read the material. Um, it, it can be a really powerful um, brain technique. Um, reflection is, the, is a combination of retrieval practice and elaboration. And it adds layers to learning and it strengthens your skills. And it also helps you sort of um, assess how your learning is going and um, see how you can do it better. Um, calibration, it allows you to align your judgments of what you know and what you don't know with objective feedback. And the objective feedback tool that we're going to use for collaboration is quizzes. We're going to use those practice quizzes to see, do I really know what I think I know? or do I need to study that more? Um, practice exams are a great way to study for the board exam too. And um, there are, oh, as we go through, I will start talking to you about resources for studying for that board exam because even though it's two years from now that you're gonna be taking it, um, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago and the second best time to plant a tree is today. So we're gonna start planting our tree so then when it's time to take that board exam, you're going to have a big, beautiful tree to work with. Um, mnemonic devices help you retrieve information that you've learned and hold arbitrary information in memory. So um, what, we'll talk about each of these things. So practice retrieving new learning from memory. What does this mean? What does retrieval practice mean? It means self-quizzing. Retrieving knowledge and skill from memory should become your primary study strategy in place of rereading your notes or rereading the um, book material. Um, to use retrieval practice as a study strategy, when you read a text or study lecture notes, pause periodically to ask yourself questions without looking at the text for the answers. Ask yourself what are the key ideas? What are terms or ideas that are new to me? How would I define them? And do the ideas relate to, or how do the ideas relate to what I already know? Um, so you can use quizzing to identify areas of weak mastery and focus your studying to make them strong. 
The harder it is for you to recall new learning from memory, the greater benefit there is to doing so. So making errors won't set you back as long as you check your answers and correct your mistakes. So um, I suggested that you take the quiz before reading the material. So take the quiz and you see what you missed and um, identify areas of weak mastery and what, you, what do you need to focus on when you're studying. Um, sometimes if you have a bunch of unrelated information, um, you can't make sense of it because you don't have hooks to hang it on or you don't have little boxes to put it in. So if you um, get a bunch of boxes by taking the quiz first, then that gives you places to put that information and then you can find it when you're looking for it later. So um, making, uh, making mistakes on a quiz, that's why I made the quiz worth zero points so you don't have to be afraid to make mistakes. Making errors isn't going to set you back because you're going to check your answers and you're going to correct your mistakes. So a lot of these um, in Make It Stick, he talked about intuition versus research. So what our intuition tells us to do is not always the best learning strategy. So what our intuition tells us to do in terms of retrieval practice, most students focus on underlining and highlighting text and lecture notes and slides, and they dedicate their time to rereading those materials and becoming fluent in the text and terminology because it feels like learning. So why this might not be true is that fluency with the text has two problems. Um, it's a misleading indicator of what you've learned, and it creates a false impression that you'll remember the material. So if you read the same thing over and over again, you say, oh yeah, I know that, um, I, you know, I've learned this information. Um, but really, if you haven't practiced retrieval of the information, then you really haven't learned it. And what you really have done is you've become fluent with the text, or you've listened to the lecture a bunch of times, and you've come, become fluent with the instructor's turn of phrase or way of saying things and um, you probably will not remember the material when it comes to the test. So according to the research, retrieval practice is better because after one or two reviews of a text, self-quizzing has far more potential for learning than additional rereading. It's far more potent for learning than additional rereading. Quizzing yourself on the main ideas and the meanings behind the terms helps you focus on the central precepts rather than on peripheral material or on what the instructor says or the, how they say it. So it really allows you to conceptualize the information. Quizzing, and that doesn't necessarily mean me quizzing you, it could be self-quizzing. You come up with questions that you then answer. Quizzing provides a reliable measure of what you've learned and what you haven't mastered. Um, quizzing arrests forgetting. Forgetting is human nature, but practice of recalling new, learn, uh, new learning secures it in memory and helps you recall it in the future. So exam taking is retrieval practice. The more we practice it, the better we get at it. A habit of regular retrieval practice throughout the duration of a course um, puts an end to cramming and all-nighters. Cramming for an exam is not an effective study strategy. Um, if you make a habit of regular retrieval practice throughout the duration of the course, you will not need to study a lot before the exam. All you'll need to do is briefly review the material the night before, and it's much easier than trying to relearn it. Okay? So um, I will give you an example of how, um, when I was in the PTA program, how my classmates and I used um, retrieval practice as a study tool. So what we did, I had a group of three or four people that I studied with throughout the program, and that's a really good tool. Study groups are an awesome tool. Um, every time, we, and we would get together once or twice a week, every time we got together, we would go through the study questions, the same study questions over and over again. So what we did is we did it orally, and we would take turns answering the questions out loud, explaining it to each other, if we came across one that we didn't know, we would look up the information, try to find it. Um, if we came across one that, boy, we were really confused on, we would mark that as, like, make sure to ask the teacher when we get into class next time. Or make sure to post that to the Ask Loretta board. So um, we would go through all of the study questions until we got to one that we had to ask about. <laughs> and then we would move on to doing other things in our, in our study session. 
So that regular retrieval practice, we didn't just go over the questions once, we went over those questions over and over again. And um, we all did really well in the exam too, I'll just tell you that. So how retrieval practice feels when you're doing it? Um, compared to rereading lecture notes or rereading the um, text material, self-quizzing can feel awkward and frustrating, especially when the new learning is hard to recall, when it's complicated information. Um, it does not feel as productive as rereading your class notes or highlighted passage. Um, if you highlighted stuff in the text and you read it and you read it again and you read it again, eventually you know that little highlighted um, passage in short-term memory and it feels like you're learning. Quizzing yourself doesn't always feel that way. It, it can feel awkward sometimes. But what you don't sense when you're struggling to retrieve new learning is the fact that every time you work hard to recall a memory, you actually strengthen it. You're actually encoding it into long-term memory. If you re-study something after failing to recall it, you actually learn it better than if, you've not, if you had not tried to recall it. The effort of reviewing knowledge or skills strengthens its staying power and your ability to recall it in the future. So retrieval practice doesn't feel as fluid as rereading information, but it's actually more powerful for encoding things into long-term memory. So the second principle is spaced retrieval practice. You want to space out your retrieval practice. So what does that mean? Space practice means studying information more than once, but leaving some time between practice sessions. So remember my story about my study group. Um, we got together once or twice a week, and we went through those study questions. So we had time in between practice sessions to forget. Um, so you want to establish a, st a schedule of self-quizzing or quizzing your study group that allows time to elapse in between the study sessions. And how much time, it depends on the material. Um, so you want to, um, if it's new material that you've never heard before, it may need to be revisited within a day or so of your first encounter with it, and then maybe not again for several days or a week. So say you have a study group that meets on Saturday mornings, or if it's an online study group, um, you get on um, Google Hangouts or Skype or something like that on Saturday morning. Um, you have taken the new material in the text that you looked at earlier in the week, you've looked at it a couple times, you've answered some of those study questions, and then several days later, or a week later, you get together with your study group and you all go through it together. That's a really good example of spaced retrieval practice. Um, flashcards can also be spaced retrieval practice. So here's the intuition versus research part. Um, intuition persuades us to dedicate stretches of time to single-minded, repetitive practice of something we want to master. The practice, practice, practice thing is called mast practice. We've been led to believe that it's essential for building mastery of a new skill or learning new knowledge. Um, it's, it's hard to distrust these intuitions for two reasons. The first reason is that when we practice something over and over, we often see our performance improving, which serves as powerful reinforcement, reinforcement of the strategy. Um, and second, we, we fail to see that the gains made during single-minded repetitive practice come from short-term memory and they quickly fade. So when we do that mass practice where we go through the same thing over and over again before we move on to something else, um, we're actually putting things in short-term memory and we're not enco encoding them into long-term memory. So. Space practice is better. Um, there's this mistaken belief that you can burn something into memory through sheer repetition. Um, lots, lots of practice does work, but only if it's spaced. If you use self-quizzing as your primary study strategy and space out your study sessions so that you allow yourself to forget a little since the last time you practiced, you will have to work a little bit harder to reconstruct what you've already studied. In effect, you're reloading it from long-term memory. You're encoding and then you're reloading. So the effort to reconstruct the learning makes important ideas more salient and memorable and connects them more securely to other knowledge and more recent learning. So um, even though repeti like endless repetition seems more productive, 
Um, you're actually only practicing short-term memory, memory. So allowing yourself to slightly forget and then reloading it helps you um, keep it encoded in long-term memory. You have to refresh that memory map in order to pull it back up. Space retri retrieval feels different from mass practice. Um, mass practice actually feels more productive than space practice, but it is not. Space practice feels more difficult because you've gotten a little rusty and the material is harder to recall. It feels like you're not really getting it. But in fact, quite the opposite is true. As you reconstruct the learning from long-term memory, as awkward as it feels, you're strengthening your mastery as well as the memory. So um, even though it feels more awkward, just like the retrieval practice that we talked about earlier, um, you're actually strengthening your memory through the struggle, if that makes any sense. So the third principle is interleaving the study of different information types. So it's another way of spacing retrieval practice to interleave the study of two or more topics so that alternating between them requires that you continually refresh your mind on each topic as you return to it. So what does this mean? Um, if you're trying to, um, like this quarter, learn kinesiology and learn how to write SOAP notes in PTA 101, alternating between the two courses causes you to work on different problems that call for different solutions. Um, a professional technical program like ours is ideally suited to interleaving because you always have two or more courses which interrelate but have a distinct area of focus. Um, as you progress through the program, you can continually reflect back on information from previous quarters and build your body of knowledge that's going to allow you to pass that comprehensive national board exam. So um, my example for interleaving for when I was a PTA student, um, when I was in school, um, I tried to treat it like it was my full-time job. In other words, um, I would be in class or in lab or studying um, a large portion of the day. Um, staying up really late to study doesn't work for me, so I had to plan my time. So I got all my study time in and I also got all my sleep time in. <laughs> so, um, so if I wasn't um, studying, I had to find some, some way to be doing it. So I had all my different um, different things that I was studying, and say I'm reading reading something in the chapter, and I feel like oh I cannot read another word. I would switch to coloring flashcards, um, and then I'm like oh this is boring. I'm not getting anything out of it. I would switch to doing something else. So every time you know switch to practicing palpation on a friend or family member. Um, so switching to a different activity, but I'm still studying. Um, the other thing I would do is, um, at the time when I was um, in school, I was teaching yoga, and I would bring my kinesiology knowledge into my yoga class, and I would review all the information as I was teaching. My students got to learn more, and I got to learn more, and I got to reinforce that information in a different way and interleave the different information types. So... Um, a lot of textbooks, including ours for kinesiology, are structured in study blocks. So they prevent a particular type of information like osteology, um, and they supply a lot of examples before moving on to another kind of problem, such as kinematics or muscle joint interaction. So when you look through the book, that's how each of the chapters is laid out. So block practice, where you study all the osteology before moving on to the kinematics, is not as effective as interleaved practice. So here's what you do. When you structure your study regimen, once you reach the point where you understand a new type of information, but maybe your grasp is still rudimentary, you don't know everything. You're never going to know everything. But anyway, you scatter that type of information throughout your practice sequence so that you're alternately quizzing yourself on various information types and retrieving the appropriate information for each. So, for example, the osteology and the kinematics. In the osteology, we're looking at different bony landmarks um, of, a, of a particular area, like the hip. Um, and then we move into the kinematics. So maybe I study, I review the osteology a little bit. I look at the study questions. I see what the questions are for osteology. Then I go to kinematics, and I um, review that a little bit. Then I go back and I go, okay, well, how do the bony landmarks of the hip apply to the kinematics? 
Um, and they do. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> so to interweave that information that you've already learned and try to figure out how the information relates. So if you find yourself falling into just a single-minded, repetitive practice of a particular topic or skill, like memorizing origins, insertions, action, innervations of muscles, change it up. Mix in practice of other subjects, other skills, constantly changing your ability to recognize different types of problem and selecting the right solution. And in fact, this is the essence of clinical practice. Seeing different types of problems and recognizing that and selecting the right solution. So um, the way that I, pr I did this interleaving practice um, when I was in kinesiology is I would be studying my origins, insertions, actions, and innervations of muscles. And then I would turn it around and I would say, okay, um, let's take a bony landmark that has muscle attachments like the greater trochanter. Um, I'm going to list everything that attaches to that bony landmark, whether it's an origin or an insertion or what, a ligament, anything. Um, and then I'm going to sort them another way. So, by, in, so instead of studying the same way every time, I'm studying them a different way each time. So every bony landmark that's on the list, I'm going to list everything that attaches to it. And then with each muscle, I'm going to list the things that it attaches to. And then I'm going to palpate those things on a person. So I'm going to interleave this, these different practices to um, form a whole body of information. So the intuition versus research. Um, most learners focus on many examples of one problem or information type at a time wanting to master that type and get it down cold before moving on to study another type. So I'm going to just study my bony landmarks until I know them, and then I'm going to go on to muscles. Interleave practice is better because mixing up information types improves your ability to discriminate between types of information and identify the unifying characteristics within a type. It improves your success in a later test or real-world setting where you have to discern the kind of problem you're studying um, when you're trying to solve in order to apply the correct solution. So, wow, that, um, that seems like a really good thing to be able to do. So, instead of just saying, okay, I'm going to study osteology for a while and then I'm going to study muscles, mix them up. Mix them together. How do these, what do, what's the deal of these bony landmarks? Um, when we start talking about Wolf's Law um, in, the, in Chapter 2, um, bones change in response to the stresses we put on them. So if there's a big protrusion on a bone, chances are good there are a lot of things that attach to it. So now we're trying to figure out the unifying characteristics of those muscle attachments and the bony landmarks. And they're, and they're there. It's amazing. So an interleaving feels different from blocked practice. So block practice, ma uh, mastering all of one type of problem before progressing to another, feels and looks like you're getting better mastery as you go. Whereas interrupting the study of one type of practice to practice a different type feels disruptive and counterproductive. Even when learners achieve superior mastery from interleague practice, the feeling that block practice is better persists. So you might experience this feeling, but now that you have the advantage of knowing that studies show the feeling is illusory and interleaf practice is, is better for learning than block practice. Okay, so the next principle is elaboration. Um, elaboration improves your mastery of new material and multiplies mental cues available to you for later recall and application of it. So what is elaboration? It's the process of finding additional layers of meaning in new material. So examples of elaboration include um, relating the material to what you already know, um, explaining it to somebody else in your own words, explaining how it relates to your life outside of class. So that's what I was saying about how I was teaching my yoga class and I was um, explaining the kinesiology principles and the movement principles and the muscle attachments as I was relating it to something outside of class. A powerful form of elaboration is to discover a metaphor or visual image for the new material. And then that also can become a mnemonic device for remembering it. So um, if you can, um, and I'm really big on analogies and metaphors you will find when you listen to my lectures. And because the more you can um, 
find something you can relate to and get your head around it, the easier it's going to be to recall. So um, a really good strategy for using elaboration is to create a summary sheet as a study tool. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a single sheet of paper and you're going to illustrate the various ideas or systems that you've studied during the week. You're going to show graphically and through keywords how the ideas interrelate with each other. This is a form of elaboration that adds layers of meaning and promotes the learning of concepts, structures, and interrelationships. You can use your summary sheet to help you study for exams. Um, back in the day when I used to do computer tech support and we were all studying for our um, Microsoft's uh, systems engineer exams, um, they used to, the study people used to recommend that you um, practice making a study sheet because when you went into the exam they would give you a sheet of paper and you could write whatever you wanted to on the sheet of paper. And so you practice making a study sheet and you did it over and over again and so then when you went into the exam you wrote your study sheet and you had that all with you. So this is sort of the same thing as creating a summary sheet. And because you're making a summary, you can't write everything on one sheet, so you have to reframe it and boil it down and elaborate and connect it to other things. This is a great way to consolidate the information. Generation has the effect of making the mind more receptive to new learning. So what is generation? It is an attempt to answer a question or solve a problem before being shown the answer to the solution. So you're generating ideas on your own before you're exposed to other ideas. So this is the same thing as taking the quiz before you've read the material. Um, on a small level, the act of filling in a missing word in a text, that is generating the word yourself um, rather than having it supplied by the writer, results in better learning and memory of the text than simply just reading a complete text. So this quarter I've supplied those practice quizzes that you can use to practice this form of learning by taking the quiz before you've read the material. This can help you focus on what you already know and what you need to study more. So taking practice exams um, for the national board exam is a really good way to study. Um, and it's, sometimes you want to practice before you've studied. So you take that practice exam and you go, oh man, I suck at neuro. I really have to study my neuro. <laughs> or, you know, that might be an exaggeration, but it really it tells you what you know and what you need to study. So um, pr trying to answer the questions before you've read the material, it makes the mind more receptive to new learning. So um, a lot of people perceive that their learning is more effective when it's experiential. Like people say, I learn more by doing something than by hearing about it. So um, you're, you're doing it rather than reading it in a text or hearing it in a lecture. So experiential learning is a form of generation. You set out to accomplish a task, you encounter a problem, and you consult your creativity, your storehouse of knowledge that you already have in trying to solve it. If necessary, you seek answers from experts, text, or the web to find that information. So by wading into the unknown first and puzzling it through, you are more likely to learn and remember the solution than if somebody sat you down and told it to you. So that's experiential learning at its best. You're generating information from what you already know. You can practice generation when you're reading new class material by trying to explain it before, uh, trying to explain before the key ideas that you expect to find in the material and how you expect they'll relate to your prior knowledge. So you might look at the introduction for each module and then write down what you think the chapter is going to be about before you even read it. Then you read the material to see if you were right. <laughs> and as a result of having made the initial effort, you'll be more astute at gleaning the substance and relevance of the reading material, even if it differs from your expectation. So you're sort of setting up that framework in your mind that you're going to put the information in. Um, in your PTA classes, you can try to answer study questions or look at case studies before reading or listening to the lecture and then you're likely to get much more out of the material and make connections faster. Um, when students wrestle with content beforehand, classroom learning is stronger. So that is pretty cool. Reflection is a combination of retrieval practice and elaboration, and it adds layers to learning and strengthens skills. So reflection is the act of taking a few minutes to review what has been learned in, re in a recent class or learning experience, like the lab, and asking yourself questions. 
Ask yourself what went well, what could have gone better. Um, what other knowledge or experiences does it remind you of? Um, what might you need to learn for better mastery? And what strategies might you use next time to get better results? So um, the what knowledges or experiences does it remind you of? Kind of reminds me, I took several years ago now, I took a silver wire jewelry class. It was great. And you're, a lot of times you're twisting these little silver um, jump rings together with two set suppliers. And it reminded me a lot of knitting. And I've been knitting for years and years. So it really kind of connected it in my mind. And then the next time I went to go do the silver jewelry, um, I could be more relaxed about it and um, enjoy it more and uh, kind of be and be involved in the creative process a little more rather than just being in the mechanical process of doing it. So it was kind of, kind of that's my little reflection. So you can practice reflection by writing um, weekly learning paragraphs. And some of the assignments that I'm going to have you do in class are, have to do with this a little bit. Um, in the learning paragraphs, you reflect on what you learned the previous week. So um, you you can characterize how your class learning connects to life outside the class. Like you can say, well, you know, last week we talked about center of gravity and base of support, and I was in yoga class, and um, I was thinking about how in triangle pose you have a pretty narrow base of support, so there's a lot of balance involved in the pose. Something like that. So how did that class learning connect to life outside the class? This is a more fruitful learning strategy than spending hours transcribing lecture slides or class notes verbatim into a notebook. So instead of um, rereading information or transcribing notes, you're connecting the information that you've learned to what you already know and your life outside the class. Calibration is the act of aligning your judgments to what you know and don't know with objective feedback. So you are... Um, it kind of corrects that illusion of mastery. And it, a lot of times, that illusion of mastery can catch you by surprise at test time. You go, wow, I thought I knew that, and I blew it on that exam. So um, calibration, what is it? Um, we're all a subject to a host of cognitive illusions. Um, a lot of times we think, oh, I really know this material in the text, and we um, mistake that for mastery of the underlying content. Um, and then we find out when we take the exam that that's not really true. So calibration is just the act of using an objective instrument like a quiz to clear away illusions and adjust your judgment to better reflect reality. So the aim is to be sure that your sense of what you know and can do is accurate. So doing practice exams and practice quizzes um, and taking practice questions for the national board exam, um, it's just a way to calibrate. Do I really know this or do I just think I know it? So we're going to practice calibration by using quizzes, study questions, and practice tests to see whether we know as much as we think we do. Um, it's worth highlighting the importance of answering questions in practice quizzes and study questions that you give yourself. Um, too often, people will look at a, a practice test or study objectives and they'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that, and then move down the page without making the effort to write in the answer. If you don't supply the answer, you might be giving in to the illusion of knowing when, in fact, you would have had difficulty coming up with an accurate or complete response. So make sure you really do write out the answer to the study questions. If you're not a writer, then type out the answers to the study question or say out the answer to the study question. But um, don't just go down and go, yep, I know that, yep, I know that. Really take the time to answer them. Um, treat practice tests as tests. Check your answers. Focus your study effort on the areas where you're not up to snuff. Where am I weak? What do I need to practice? So that's what calibration is for. Mnemonic devices help you retrieve what you have learned and hold arbitrary information in memory. So a mnemonic device can sort of be analogous to the little tab that you put on folders in your file cabinet. If you just had all your pages in there and none of the folders were, were, were labeled or had tabs, you would have to sort through everyone every time. It would take you forever to find things if you ever found it. But that mnemonic device is that little tab that sort of, oh, there it is, and it lets you pull it out. So mnemonic is from the Greek word for memory. Um, mnemonic devices are like mental file cabinets. They give you handy ways to store information and find it again when you need it. So we have sort of 
infinite uh, memory storage, but very limited retrieval storage. So anything we can do to improve our, our retrieval is much better. So mnemonics are not necessarily tools for learning, but they are um, used for creating mental structures that make it easier to retrieve what you've learned. So when I talk about the, um, the innervation of the um, diaphragm, um, it's innervated by the, C, um, the uh, nerve roots above C4. And so if, if you have a spinal injury above C4, um, the mnemonic for that is C4, breathe no more. You're going to need um, artificial ventilation support. But C4, breathe no more doesn't really tell you anything. It gives you a handle. To, to hook that information out of long-term memory. So mnemonics are not really tools for learning, but they give you those mental handles, those tabs on your mental file cabinet so you can find things. So here are just some examples of what some successful students have used as study skills for employing these ideas. So working through the study questions prior to a lecture, that's generation. Um, anticipating test questions and their answers um, as you read. That's also generation. Answering rhetorical questions in your head while you're listening to those lectures um, to test your retention of the material and relate them to prior learning. That's retrieval practice and interleaving, the relating to prior learning. Um, reviewing study guides and finding terms you can't recall or don't know and relearning those terms. That's spaced retrieval. Um, while you're reading, copying um, bolded terms into, um, that are in the text and their definitions into a reading notebook and making sure you understand them. That's retrieval practice. Using flashcards and mnemonic devices to reinforce recall. That's, um, that can be um, retrieval practice or spaced retrieval if you use them correctly. Um, taking practice tests that are provided online by the instructor. Um, from those practice tests, you discover which concepts you don't know, and then you can make a point to learn them. That's calibration. Um, reorganizing the course information into a study guide of your design. That's elaboration. That's like making those summary sheets. Um, if you organize it into a study guide that makes sense to you, it is a much better way to consolidate the information. Making summary sheets for concepts that are detailed or important posting them on your bathroom mirror or an often seen location and test yourself on them from time to time. That's space retrieval and elaboration. So you can combine these skills. You can space out your retrieval practice over the duration of the course. That's space retrieval. Um, write a paragraph summarizing what you learned last week. That's reflection. So um, by employing these different skills, um, you can really learn a huge body of knowledge. Um, and actually, um, one of the students from last year's cohort um, was struggling with um, some of the information and emailed me and said, you know, what am I doing wrong? How can I do things? And so my first response back to him was I said, um, how are you studying? What's your process? And he said, well, first I read through all the material. And that takes a long time. That probably takes most of my time. Um, then I listen to the lectures. Then I um, do the assignments. And then if I have time, I go through the study questions. OK, so that's completely backwards from what I So I said, OK, I want you to do things differently. I want you to go through the study questions first, um, then do the assignments, um, then read the material and listen to the lectures and um, see how that goes. Well, he told me um, it actually felt more fluid, um, and he, he felt like he was getting a better grip on the information. So um, it might be different from what you've done before, but try it and see how it comes out for you. Try some of these tools and see if you get a better grasp of the information. And I'd be really um, fascinated to see if if the whole class uses these tools, um, how are we going to do on the exams? I think we're going to do pretty darn well, but um, you guys will show me.